Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to our world of darkness and level by level. Today, we're going to go a little bit deeper into Thin Blood Alchemy, not quite hitting the levels, but a prerequisite to understanding exactly what Thin Blood Alchemy runs off of, and that is primarily Blood Resonance. So today, I'm going to go through the section of the core book, which is called The Blood is the Life. Now, the first thing that it says is in this section is human blood powers a vampire's body without fresh juice a kindred lies still torpid and powerless its dead heart beats only when fueled by the stolen essence of life its eyes only work when the corona and viscous body flows with blood all vampires know vital fluids consist of far more than plasma, blood cells, and platelets. Some unknowable link to the kind soul gives every person's red rum its particular kick and effect. Perhaps it's just hormones or the traces of the incessant bioelectrical current of mind, but a victim's feelings profoundly affect the kindred system. Drink deep enough and the resonance of a victim rises to the surface, first as a sharp taste in the blood, then as images, whispers, and feelings, clots of unresolved trauma and clusters of rising hope, crisp memories, a ghost-like presence, or visions of heart-rending moments can occur just as blood loss nears the fatal amount. A kill always gives the strongest, most lasting rush, so the temptation is always there. The rush of blood is not just a high, it's a state where the blood changes the vampire's own resonance a bit. Plain melancholic blood is a good buzz to be on when obfuscate, but that uniquely subservient dog walker with deep mommy issues, owes a special breed of submission that takes dominate possible without eye contact. That's what kindred call a dyscrasia, licks call a clot, and players call a must drink SPC. So what it's saying is you do get specific boosts depending on what you eat and how much you eat of it. This is something that does tend to get pushed to the wayside in games from my experience. Uh, drinking from a person ends up being just a way to fuel the powers, but not a way to actually fuel the emotional progression in a game. Maybe that needs to be taken into consideration, not just for Thin Blood Alchemy, but in Vampire in general. Resonance. Blood type is expressed as resonance. Unless looking only for survival or fuel, a drinker should care what prey they feed from and how. Vampires drink blood. Mortals eat food. Resonance flavors the blood, turning drinking into dining. It's not about genetics, even if family often does carry a tendency towards a certain resonance. It's more about the combination of the vessel's temperament and the victim's state of mind in the moment of feeding. Kindred employed dozens of different frameworks to describe resonance, from Japanese adolescent blood type astrology to American business school Meyer Briggs phrenology. Indian licks talk about, I'm about to butcher a word severely. Indian licks talk about Arvedic Guinness. Decadent Torridor fans of Gorif map their meals on an enogram. A sewer rat in Geneva claims to use Jung's original notebook to construct a unified theory of blood function. But the most common method used by Tremere Thaumaturge and Duskborn street cookers alike reflects on the four humors of classic medicine in medieval alchemy. The crucible of alchemy says the warlock's limbs a metaphor for the vampire body. The salts and metals in the crucible 
represent the elements of the blood, refined by the fire of the emotion in the moment. According to these Tremere, alchemy is all about scarring or inflaming kind in just the right way and drinking at just the right moment. It might be medieval mystification, but as the Mercurians can confer, it does reliably get you high. To vampires whose blood does in fact hold magical ingredients and shape personalities, these latter-day alchemists make a compelling argument. Now, that's very fun because that's one of the first times you see in the book where mechanically it discusses how blood is like a drug and that the different types that you drink could actually change you in a fashion. And I also like the fact that it does compare the Duskborn blood alchemist to the Tremere in this standpoint because there's actually a part of me that thinks that the Tremere would either try to make Duskborn Tremere or kidnap Tremere to stockpile formulas so that they always have it. I know if I was playing a Tremere, that's what I would do. I would kidnap Duskborn and force them to make me potions. I'm sorry, I just see that as the next step in the Tremere power struggle, is making sure that whatever Thin Blood Alchemists they can find are not necessarily on their side, but are definitely working for them. Let's let, Now let's discuss what they were talking about in the Crucible of Alchemy section, where it talks about the mystification of medieval alchemy methods. And that is the four humors, or liquids of the body. Now the last time the four humors came into play in Vampire the Masquerade, to my knowledge, was in the Faith and Fire book for Vampire the Masquerade Dark Ages. And uh, and I'm, I'm sure that was in the tabletops too, but I specifically know it from the LARP setting. And that is with the Lamia, or, a, uh, or, or basically the bodyguard clan of of the Cappadocians. This is a subsect of Cappadocians, a small bloodline that practice potence instead of aspects, and their own specific type of mortis, or their version of necromancy back then, was known as the Path of the Four Humors, and it affected the different liquids in the body and caused fun plague-like effects when it came to dealing damage to things. Nowadays, however, we are dealing with something a little bit different, and that's the fact that the four humors affect all the vampires. And the book goes on to say, the four humors go back to ancient Egyptian and Babylonian medicine, but Hippocrates codified them for the West around 400 BC. He described them as color or zenth ecalia, which actually translates basically just yellow bile. This is where we get the, uh, this is where we get colic from when a child has yellowish skin and yellowish eyes or uh, cholera. Also, um, melancholia or black bile, white phlegm, not just modern phlegm, but also saliva, limps, and the liquid of lung and brain, and the red hema, or blood. Thus, as the various humors predominate in the human system, people turn caloric, melancholic, phalamic, or sanguine. Modern alchemists point out that the blood sedimentation test demonstrates the existence of all four humors in the blood. Black platelets and clots at the bottom, red blood cells above that, white cells governing them, and finally, clear plasma colored yellowish with bilirubins. Licks more thirsty than scholarly, just break the four humors down to angry, sad, lazy, and horny. So that does make a lot of sense. I like the fact that it goes into um, the medieval information followed by the common medical information and then it goes into basically just streetwise with angry sad lazy and horny it does make a lot of sense uh for what those things are going to pull out of an individual and you really don't need to know all about it but when you're dealing with something like thin blood alchemy you do need to know where exactly your sources come from okay so 
Also, uh, to point out with the four humors, they also do have a, a very interesting correspondence list that you can go with. Uh, so let's start with Kalark. The Kalark humor, which is your angry uh, streetwise saying there, uh, focuses on the element of fire. Anger, fire, passion. You can see where it's coming from with that one. Uh, now, if you go into Jungian, uh, rhetoric, which is where we get our archetypes from when it comes to like creating characters and things like that, you get feeling. This is a person who is passionate and has feeling. Uh, the hormone related to that would be adrenaline, which does make a lot of sense because this is your anger speaking. And then emotions and conditions are going to be angry, violent, bullying, passionate and envious. So if you see anybody who's giving off those vibes, that angry, virant, bullying, jealous kind of thing, you're gonna go for that. And the resonance will actually affect disciplines, which we'll get into further, but I do want to point out that Caloric also feeds into the disciplines of celerity and potence. So if you're playing a Thin Blood and you feed off those resonances, the, the Caloric resonance, you are most likely to, going to be able to feed into a, a level of celerity or a level of potence. Now, Melancholy is going to be Earth, because it's more grounded, and it's hooked into the Jungian aspect of thinking. The thyroid gland is where you're going to get your hormone uh, connection. And then also it's going to be sad, scared, intellectual, depressed, and grounded. Um, and with that one also fortitude because you're not really fighting back and obfuscate because you just want to hide from the world. These are all connected in that fashion. Then we have phlegmatic, which is connected to the element of water, so it's more fluid. The Jungian aspect is intuition, so it's going with your thought, going with the flow. And then uh, the pituitary gland is where we're going on that one for hormones. And then lazy, apathetic, calm, controlling, and sentimental. I think that's very interesting that it does get mixed in that, but if you do think about it, people who tend to seem calm or apathetic might be a little passive aggressive and able to guilt people into doing things. So I can kind of see the controlling aspect on that. Phlegmatic also is very high into the aspects and dominate range of disciplines. And when you stop and think about the concept of being able to look at somebody and just tell them what to do or know what they're thinking, which is where the phlegmatic humor comes into play, that does make a lot of sense on there. Uh, sanguine, our final one, is connected to the air element. Our Jungian uh, function is sensation. This is going to be your horny archetypes. Not necessarily just horny, but more like your, your lust for life um, kind of archetypes. If you're thinking about it in like a god form, you could actually look at sanguine being connected to uh, Aphrodite or Venus in the Greco-Roman pantheons. Uh, their hormone is going to be testosterone and estrogen, which makes a lot of sense because those are the sex hormones. And those are going to be the things that fill you with the need to act on your human impulses. Then we get into the emotions and conditions, which are going to be horny, happy, addicted, active, flighty, and enthusiastic. And I love the fact that flighty is put in there because when you're talking about somebody who is filled with the uh the the lustful elements of life they do get easily distracted now don't they um as for uh disciplines we're looking at blood sorcery and presence not blood alchemy if you notice thin blood alchemy is left off of that list because it runs off all the different types of humors which is why we decided to go through this there is one other uh, resonance, which is not listed in the four human because it's not human. And that is the animal resonance, the animal blood. And that is going to help you out with like animalism and protean, but humans in basic emotional equilibrium, well adjusted, experiencing fleeting bursts of all four resonance in their day to day lives. An intense temperament indicates a human with a very strong tendency towards one or another resonance. This connection might be due to a mental illness, age, past trauma, drug addiction, or just a very addictive reward loop. A good looking person who enjoys sex can easily become intensely sanguine thanks to seeking and getting their kicks every night. 
and acute resonance is so intense that it creates a self-sustaining reaction in the blood. Kindred have adopted Hippocrates' term of dyscrasia, or bad mixture, to refer to this effect. Younger licks, careless of alchemy and hematology alike, refer to it as a clot. So dyscrasia is a very interesting thing due to the fact that, like, it is considered bad mixture, and it might even be considered a bad trip, but it does tend to give you a little bit of an extra boost, and that goes into a little bit more detail in the resonance and disciplines section. Why should a lick care about Hippocrates? Because resonance gives blood more than flavor and savor. Intense resonance gives it power, and a dyscrasia, well, that gives the best hit of all. Resonance don't just give flavor to a victim's blood and personality, but also blend with vampire blood to energize disciplines. And like I said, I, I already gave the listing of it, but we will go over it again. Calorica, Celerity, and Potence. Melancholy is Fortitude and Obfuscate. Phlegmatic is Auspex and Dominate. Sanguine is Blood Sorcery and Presence. And Animal Blood gives you access to Animalism and Protean. Uh, people all taste and kick different. And certain people make certain powers easier while a vampire is drunk on them. And I love that. I love the term drunk on them. After hundreds of victims, patterns begin to emerge to a feeder. The sad kills help you fade from sight. The horny kills boost the pool. And the angry ones fuel the punching. Blood accretes through time, combining and subliming through the strange alchemies that generate the supernatural effects of the gifts of Cain. This is the way the kindred overtly learn and develop disciplines. With a combination of feeding from a teacher and practicing conscious and often learned feeding habits, vampires complement the process with undead biofeedback, pushing Vitae through the vampiric system, revivifying kindred organs, chakras, or nerve clusters at just the right moment. What you eat lays the foundation of what you can do. And that goes for your enemies as well. Smart Fangs study feeding habits and figure out the strengths and weaknesses of other kindred. Every drinker in the world has their own pattern of feeding changing or static over time. Perhaps all vampires, irrespectively of age, generation, skill, and learning, intuitively look for the kind of blood that hones their curse and their disciplines to perfection. I love this. And this was like the main, this, this is like the main look at why certain clans have certain disciplines and also why certain uh, predator types give you access to certain disciplines. And I, I love that because when you stop and look at it, when you look at the predator types, you'll see that specific clans in Vampire the Masquerade do tend to fall stereotypically in certain predator types, like Ventru and Osiris make a lot of sense, or or Ventru and, and Cleaver, or uh, Toreador and Siren. These are things that you would just accept. Alley Cat and Bruja. These, uh, the, these things affect the blood and it shows why those clans have those disciplines. And I, I just love predator type because it lets you step outside the box and build a per, uh, personality of your character that is outside of the realm of the old method of Vampire the Masquerade character creation. And that is just so cool in my opinion. Effects on temperaments. Fleeting temperament provides storytelling juice and savors to the hunt. But it has no immediate mechanical effect except as thin blood alchemy ingredients. That said, even fleeting temperaments flavor the blood sufficiently to justify buying dots in their associated discipline. Drinking blood with intense temperaments gives the drinker one additional die four dice pools involving a d discipline that corresponds with that resonance. This bonus lasts until the vampire's next drink of blood dilutes it or until the vampire system empties of blood when the hunger reaches five. That is something that I've never used in my game. 
I would like to know. Do, are there any players in my game? Come on, guys. There's a few of you who actually watch these videos. Do any of you? Did any of you know that? That if you feed off specific humors, you get a, bo a boost in specific disciplines that you already have. You get ec an extra die. That is beneficial. And I know Davaga31 is going to be listening to this in like a day or two. And when he does, the next game session is going to be him rooting around like a freaking hog trying to find truffles. Looking for specific discipline boosts. Tapping a Discrasia. Vessels with an accurate temperament provide the same discipline bonus as intense resonance. They also incorporate a dyscrasia, which conveys a more sublime or powerful benefit to the drinker. The requirement to gain an effect varies between different dyscrasias, but unless otherwise stated, the vampire must kill and drain the vessel or feed from them over the course of three nights. Some discrasias can only be tapped once before leaving the blood of the victim. Others linger and can be gained on repeated occasions. The effect of discrasia usually lasts until the kindred feeds again or reaches a hunger of five, just as it said uh, for the effects of temperament. So I can see specific people keeping Discrasia rich humans captive. This is, in my opinion, the first thing that goes into my head is the Malkavian who has an asylum under his control and knows what's on the menu for what. A Discrasia could be very interesting if somebody has impulse control issues or or uh, or uh, nymphomania or psoriasis men or um some type of aggressive outburst syndrome or something like that. Like, this is something that you could definitely take advantage of. Hunting and humors. Determining what resonance a vessel has makes feeding more than just a pit stop. Most vampires observe their victims from a distance or engage them in conversation to feel them out. Role playing should give a pretty good idea of what resonance a victim's blood carries, but after stalking or talking for a scene, the storyteller may allow a resolve plus insight test to clarify matters. Resolve plus insight after a conversation to try to figure out what resonance you're talking to. That's a damn good idea. Uh, tasting the blood of a human dispels all doubts. The storyteller's description of the taste, texture, and kick of the blood should give the leech a clear indication of what resonance the mortal carries. If the mortal harbors a discrasia, the storyteller may hint at its nature. When a character slakes a level of hunger from a victim, they feel the rush of the essence locked in the victim's blood. This rush of resonance may kick vampiric powers into overdrive or manifest as a unique condition. To determine the temperament of a potential victim that the storyteller or scenario author hasn't created in detail before the session, roll a d10 to determine the random temperament. If you get a six or higher on the die, roll again to determine the human's resonance. The storyteller should absolutely shift the numbers dependent on the surrounding environment. Nightclubs encourage sanguine and don't attract phlegmatic. Uh, Protestant churches, perhaps the opposite. So in that situation, what they're basically saying is if you've got a player who's going to be feeding off somebody that you have not built specifically as a residence bag for one reason or another you roll a d6 on a one to five you have a balanced negligible resonance in other words you just have a standard civilian um you have a person who does not really have inclinations of one way or the other uh if you get a six to eight it's fleeting which means they do have a resonance but it is something that's probably not going to be uh, that big of a deal. Um, if they get a 9 to 10, it's an intense potential acute and to roll again. Um, so yeah, 1 to 8, intense, 10, acute uh, is pretty much that. Uh, and then after that, you roll again. If you if you do get uh, if you do get a an intense kind of thing, you you roll again. 
and the resonance is uh, one to three phlegmatic, four to six melancholy, seven to eight caloric, and nine to ten sanguine. But that being said, you do need to take in consideration where exactly those people are. It, you're probably going to have very, very few depressed people hanging out in a nightclub, or considering the individual, they might actually be pretty depressed. They might actually just be trying to uh, get rid of their issues when it comes to that. Changing resonances. Characters can change a victim's resonance through role playing or through the various social systems of the game. If the character successfully scares, seduces, or drugs their victim, the storyteller should shift the victim's resonance to match. If a vampire seduces a scared victim, for example, the human gains a sanguine, fleeting temperament while their melancholic resonance is temporarily submerged. You ever been so scared you're kind of turned on? That's basically what they're saying. Um, <laughs> intensifying a victim's resonance follows a similar process to increase their temperament by one step, from fleeting to intense, intense to acute. On a successful social test, or following a cool role-playing scene, once a victim acutely feels a resonance, a properly callous vampire can begin the long process of manipulating them into a dyscrasia. A love affair with a mortal lasting for months or years may lead to them developing an appropriately sanguine plot. Keeping a victim locked up for months to endure repeated waterboarding or brainwashing could develop a melancholic or caloric dyscrasia. Depending on the precise sequence and nature of the confinement, such long term grooming and abuse of victims is not a scientific process and likely incurs plenty of stains. Chronicle tenants more likely forbid torture, but some may excuse themselves for seducing a mortal into a sanguine farming love affair. Humane vampires find it distasteful. It's up to the storyteller to determine what works and how much dyscrasia farming damages a kindred's humanity. Now that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to talk to you guys about this today because this is Thin Blood Alchemy's basis in a lot of cases. If you're going to keep humans to use them as your Athenors, then this is something that you need to take into consideration is is your character willing to farm humans for this process to farm resonances out of people now the book goes on to describe various sample dyscrasias and there's quite a few of them and they're very well written i highly suggest you getting into that and checking that out in fact in this class, welcome to your homework. Read the sample dyscrasias. If anybody does actually do that, obviously I can't enforce anything, but if anybody does do that, I'd like to know what your, your favorite dyscrasias are in the comments. Um, but the book also goes on to talk about resonance and experience and how specific resonances dictate how you should spend your XP. So take that into consideration also for your storytelling. Um, I know I'm going to, but this, this intense look at the four humors inside the human body and therefore inside the kindred body after we've consumed them really does push how important blood is in Vampire the Masquerade 5th edition. It's never been this important. And yes, where we're playing vampire, obviously blood's important. You gotta drink it to power your disciplines to wake up. V5 has put it into a higher area of consideration. Because we're not just discussing, oh, what we're gonna drink to wake up. We're discussing what is going to fuel our powers. And on the topic of thin blood alchemy specifically, the humors, the resonances in the blood dictate what you can do no matter what your type of distillation method is. So next episode, we're going to be getting into the actual powers that Thin Blood Alchemy have to 
offer. And now that we have a better understanding of what exactly the resonances can do to help us become better blood alchemists. I'm wondering how many of you out there are considering making a thin blood. And if you are, what distillation method do you think you're going to use? Please like, share, comment. I would love comments. Comments are the most important part. Um, <laughs> but I believe that is what we are going to be covering today. Class dismissed.